Well, welcome back for our second session as we continue to look and to meditate upon these four last things. Remember that in this series, what we are hoping to do is give some practical and pastoral meditations on death, judgment, hell, and heaven. And in our previous session, we had the opportunity to look at the biblical necessity that we have to prepare for death, right? Given what death is and how the scriptures speak of death, we have a great imperative, we have a great need to ensure that we are prepared for that moment when we will face the irrevocable and inevitable reality of our own deaths. But one of the humbling things about scripture is that not just any preparation will do. You think of some of those most fearful words that Jesus ever spoke from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Where Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, and near the end of it, <clears throat> declares, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. <clears throat> Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And Jesus, in the very least, communicates in those words that there will be many people on the day of judgment who are caught unexpectedly and unaware of their eternal destination. That there will be those who will stand before the presence of Christ and say, but didn't we do everything we were supposed to? Didn't we perform these mighty deeds? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And that Jesus will look at them and he will say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. As Jesus tells his disciples there that it is only the one who does the will of his Father in heaven who will, in the words that he later speaks, receive the commendation, Well done, good and faithful servant. And so as these many people that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 7 thought that they were prepared to face death and the reality of judgment, and it wasn't uncovered until that day that they weren't, we have so much more, a greater need, to make sure that not only are we preparing for death, but that we are preparing rightly for death. Right? Even in a culture like ours that disdains death and tries to ignore it and tries to hide it from the public eye and we don't like to think about it, uh, there are many people who do try to prepare in some measure for death. Right? And they're so caught up in preparing for their funerals and preparing for the service that's going to go on and where their bodies are going to be buried that they're uh, concerned with preparing for death by amassing a large fortune to make sure that their loved ones and their family are taken care of and what's going to happen with their house and their possessions and what are all these things going to do, make sure they have a living will, right? All these things can feel like good and fruitful and important ways to prepare for death and to varying degrees it is important to think of these things. But far more important it is to make sure that our souls are prepared for death. And to be quite honest, uh, deciding which kid gets the house, uh, deciding which insurance policy you should take out on your life after you die, uh, deciding where you want to be buried, these things may be of some importance, but they do nothing in preparing the soul to face death. And so we have a need to prepare, but we have a need to prepare rightly. Now, in this session, we're going to go over, largely borrow, uh, what Bolton speaks of. And Bolton lays down both the means of how it is that we are to rightly prepare ourselves, but he also looks at some virtues that we ought to cultivate in order to prepare for death. So we want to divide the session into those two parts to first look at the means, what means do we use to prepare ourselves for death, and then what virtues ought we to cultivate to prepare for death. 
Now, Bolton lays it down very succinctly, these different means that we are to use in preparing for death. On pages 31 and 32 of my copy, Bolton writes, and I quote at some length, but it's good, right? He says that we are to work with the prosper... Uh, sorry, I apologize. That we are to, therefore... Ensure the prosperity of our souls by all the blessed means that God has given. The ministry, sacraments, prayer, conference, meditations, humiliation days, holiness of life, clearness of conscience, watching over our hearts, walking with God, a sanctified use of our afflictions, experimental observation of God's dealings with us from time to time, works of justice, mercy, and truth, and thereby these things quicken, they fortify, they galvanize your faith, that in the bitterest extremity of your spiritual distress, you may be able to say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. A thousand more crosses and calamities and troubles may overtake you before you take your leave of this veil of tears. <clears throat> End quote. So Bolden lays down a number of means. We're not going to look at all of those specifically, but I want to draw your attention uh, to at least five of the means that Bolton speaks of. And the first one is that he says that we ought to make use of the means of grace right, of preaching, of the sacraments, and of prayer. Now, this is something that as a confessional Presbyterian church, we can utter our hearty amen to, right? As we noted in the last session, that there are so many pulpits that are obsessed with the triviality and with the fleeting things of this life. And I noted for you that as a pastor and as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that one of my biggest objectives and ministering to Christ's people is to prepare them to die well. And God, in his grace, has given us these means of the preaching of the word, of the sacraments, and of prayer to help prepare us to face the reality of death. As we come and we sit under the reading and the preaching of God's word, right? we don't do this so much with the expectation or the anticipation that we're going to have our best life now, or that this is all about how to influence people and become a leader in our communities, right? But the scriptures and the preaching of the word puts before us the sober and the weighty realities of life and death, of heaven, of hell, of judgment, of salvation, in order that by faith we might see Christ more clearly and cling to him for hope. I remember one pastor commenting in a conference speech that he had given, right? That what gives preaching, what gives the mantle of preaching its weightiness is that it is a mantle that is soaked in the blood of Jesus and it is singed by the fires of hell. And Bolton would have us to know that if we are to be prepared in mind and heart and soul and strength for death, then we must make use of the means of grace. We must gladly embrace the preaching of the word and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper in public and private prayer. A second means that Bolton notes is that we ought to hold conference. Right now, this is just a term that was used back then uh, that really meant sharing in the communion of the saints. Right? That is, that we prepare ourselves for death as we hold fellowship with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. As in all things in the Christian life, we're not meant to just encourage ourselves or to be these maverick Christians, but we are called to sacrificially serve and to live life alongside other believers that help encourage us, right? You think of the Pilgrim's Progress and of Christian and how often he was encouraged and furthered to the celestial city, not as an individual, but that as he came into contact with the 
host of God's people and his evangelist and his faithful and his all these other people spurred him on and encouraged him to eventually cross that river of death and enter into the celestial city. Right, that we are meant to hold conference, to hold close communion and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That type of communion and conference where we don't just sit around and talk about sports or talk about the weather or talk about how big our fish was, but the fellowship that Hebrews gets at. That we are to encourage one another daily while it's still called today, lest there be found in any of us a heart of unbelief that has been hardened by the deceitfulness of of sin. So we're to make use of each other, we're to make use of hospitality, of fellowship, of the lives of others, of our brothers and sisters to spur us on and to encourage us, and in this way we prepare ourselves for death. A third means that Bolton talks about is holiness of life and of cultivating a clear conscience before God and that in all of our days and our ways that we walk with God. Right, Bolton notes this, again, perhaps a lengthy quote, but a good quote. But that happy man who in the short summer's day of his miserable and mortal life gathers grace with a holy greediness and plies the noble trade of Christianity with resolution and undauntedness of spirit against the boisterous current and corruption of the times. It is this one who grows in godliness, grows in God's favor, grows in the fruits of good life. It is he who purchases and preserves, though with the loss of all earthly delights, a peace of conscience, which is one of the richest treasures and the rarest jewels that ever enlightened and made light the heart of man in this world, end quote. We prepare ourselves for death when we walk in the uprightness and in the integrity of the truth. When we keep our hearts and our minds and souls unstainted, sorry, untainted and unstained by the imperfections of the flesh, when we fight sin, when we resist sin. Later on, as Bolton contemplates death itself, and we'll look at this, he notes that often on the deathbed, the devil is most active. And that one of the great difficulties in dying is that he brings to remembrance all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shortcomings. And while we love the gospel and we love the blood of Jesus that is effectual to forgive us for all of these sins, what a joy having a clear conscience is. What a joy it is to have peace of mind. What a joy it is to be abounding in good works and in holiness of life so that when we come to face death, there's no regrets or there's at least less regrets than there could have been to look unto Jesus our Savior and to say, but for the grace of God... Here I have kept myself untarnished. Here I have been blameless by your grace. To keep a pure conscience. To walk in the holiness of life. To fight and to resist sin with every fiber of our being. That will only promote a good death. That will only promote comfort in death. A fourth thing that Bolton lays out in a fourth means is to remember God's kind dealings with us in the past. Particularly in moments of difficulty, in the moments of death, uh, right? we can lose sight of all the good and all the kind things that God has done for us. As the psalmist calls out in Psalm 103, right? Forget not his mercies and all of his benefits towards you. Right? We have such short-lived memories and minds. We easily forget things. And we easily forget the grace and the mercy that God has so kindly and lovingly bestowed upon us. And so Bolton says, meditate on those things. Remember fruits of our union with Christ. Remember the good days, the pleasurable days. Remember his kindnesses and his tender mercies towards you. And so in these ways, Bolton encourages us to make use of
these means. You know, in that quote that we read earlier from him, he speaks with such a clarity, with such force when he says that there ought to be within us a holy greediness for grace. And that's what we ought to strive for in the course of our lives, to never be content, to never be satisfied with the measure of grace that we currently have, but to always be imploring the Lord by the means that he has given for more grace and more grace and more grace. And so Bolton says, make use of all of these means because these means awaken and they strengthen faith in the hearts and the minds of God's people so that we are prepared to face the truth and the reality of death. So the first thing that we learn here and how to prepare for death are the different means that we ought to focus on. But Bolton, secondly, looks not only at the means, but also at some particular virtues that we ought to cultivate in our hearts, our minds, and our souls if we want to prepare well for death. Now, in his book, The Four Last Things, Bolton lays out a number of virtues, and we're not going to go through all of them, but I only want to consider uh, four different virtues that Bolton says we ought to cultivate as we prepare for death. And the first virtue that we ought to cultivate is that Bolton says we ought not to weaken our spirit by overthinking and over worrying. We ought not to weaken our spirits by overthinking and over worrying. Now, many of us know these words, and yet how helpful and important they are to be reminded of them again and again. That Jesus, as he was preaching his Sermon on the Mount, right, that he confronts anxiety in his people's hearts. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus asks, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And later on in verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And as Jesus diagnoses our hearts, he does it so simply and so profoundly that there are few things that living people get as anxious about as their deaths. And Jesus says, for all of your anxiety and for all of your worrying, are you able to add a single day to your life? You think of all the things that we do in life, about all the care and the concerns and the burdens that we have in preparing for death. Right? We often want to mask over these things and baptize them and say, well, we're, we're being prudent. But maybe if we're honest with ourselves, maybe more often than not, what drives us is an ungodly worry and anxiety. What's going to happen to my wife when I die? Where are my kids going to be when I die? What's going to happen to all of my material possessions? Are the people that I love and care for, are they going to be taken care of? Who's going to do this once I'm gone? Who's going to do that? How am I supposed to uh, go on living knowing that they're going to be struggling in this way or in that way? And we can become so burdened down with overthinking and overworrying about life and about death and about what's coming tomorrow that Bolton says this just weakens our spirits. And in our anxiety, we think that we are preparing for death, when in reality we're stealing the fortitude and the faith that we need to face death. And so the first virtue Bolton speaks about is don't overthink and don't overworry about things in life and about matters of death. Right? This overthinking and overworrying, this can be both a positive thing. You think of that parable that Jesus told of that man who just needed to build bigger barns for what he had. He was so materially blessed by the Lord that he was just consumed. Bigger barns, bigger barns, bigger barns. I just need more and more to store all these wonderful things that I have. 
And Jesus says this man was a fool because his life would be demanded from him that night. In positive ways, we can be overly concerned and overthinking and overworrying about the things of life and negative things. We can have so much doubt, so much fear, so much anxiety, so much trepidation about death. Now, these things don't foster faith. They don't reinforce faith. They don't strengthen faith. And so Bolton says, don't weaken your spirit by overthinking and overworrying. The second virtue that Bolton speaks of is he says that we must beware of worldly comforts that eat up heavenly delights. I love that graphic phrase he uses, worldly comforts that eat up heavenly delights. Similarly, he gives the warning against making sure that we avoid worldliness at all costs. Right? That too often, worldly comforts seem to placate us. That all too often, our hope rests in worldly comforts rather than in heavenly delights. And if we're going to be prepared for death, then we need to think of worldly comforts rightly and we must never let those drown out or eat up heavenly delights and Bolton, as he speaks of this he tells us you know we ought to compare the objects of earthly comfort or worldly comfort with the objects of heavenly delight he says what do we see of worldly comforts and he notes this on pages 53 and 54 he says of the object Right, that the matter whereupon earthly joy does feed is often base and it is vile and it is filthy and it is reveling in our days and it is roaring in lust and in luxury and other such froth and fooleries. The very garbage of hell. Right, that often... Our worldly comforts are nothing but sin. That they are nothing but what Bolton calls the garbage of hell. But then Bolton goes on and he says, but even of our best earthly comforts, right? even of the earthly comforts of corn, of wine, of oil, of gold, of greatness, of offices, of honors, of high rooms, of princely favors, what are these things? They're transitory, and they're as transitory as a hasty, headlong torrent, a shadow, a ship, a bird, an arrow, a post that hasteneth by, or if you can name anything of swifter wing, and it is sooner gone. And Bolton says of all the earthly comforts that we delight in, even of the best of these, they are but transitory and they disappear like that and so why would we put so much stock in it why would we put so much comfort and he says but of heavenly delights now, these things are true and these things are honorable and these things are steadfast and these are things that don't leave us right that there is a continuance to heavenly delights where there is a lack of continuance with worldly comfort and so Bolton says that we must beware of worldly comforts. We must beware that we don't put too much stock in the things of this world to the neglect of the heavenly delights. That our earthly comforts, they cost so much and give so little, but of heavenly delights, they give all and in all circumstances. So the second virtue is that we must flee worldliness. We must flee building our castles on the shifting sands of this world. And we must cultivate within us that virtue that Jesus spoke of, of seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. How dangerous worldliness is, and how dangerous worldly comforts can become. 
The third virtue that Bolton draws our attention to is that we must fight the fear of death by faith. Right? That we must fight the fear of death by faith. Now, Bolton, as he discusses this, notes how God gives grace to his suffering people. That we don't need to fear death and we don't need to fear afflictions. We don't need to be consumed by these things because in the hour of our affliction, God will surely provide the strength and the grace that we need. And he looks at three figures from church history, at least two of them which are probably not well known by many Christians today, of Athanasius, of Christostom, and of the one that most of us are probably familiar with, Luther. Martin Luther, right, that all these men experienced great afflictions, and yet we see how the Lord's grace delivered them from all of their afflictions. So Bolton looks at a number of historical figures, but he could have, and we can just as easily look at biblical examples, right? We think of that wonderful chapter in Hebrews, which is often called uh, the Hall of Faith, where we, uh, the, the preacher of Hebrews, takes us through this uh, glorious array of God's people and the things that they accomplished by the promises of God. And kind of at the climax of this chapter, right, he says that time would fail him to tell of all these different uh, men of faith and women of faith who by faith, you know, attained these promises and conquered things. And he comes to this grand crescendo and he says of all these who through faith conquered kingdoms they enforced justice they obtained promises they stopped the mouths of lions they quenched the power of fire they escaped the edge of the sword they were made strong out of weakness became mighty in war put foreign armies to flight women received back their dead by resurrection some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And you know what the preacher of Hebrews does there is he says that faith, that faith covers all the vast array of human experiences. That first he looks at all those who, even by human standards, were conquerors and they were triumphant and they received all these innumerable blessings in this life from God. And yet the preacher of Hebrews says they did this by faith. It was by faith that they conquered kingdoms. It was by faith that they quenched the fires. It was by faith that they received back their dead. And then the preacher of Hebrews turns and he goes, but not everybody had such worldly success and prosperity and blessing as these people, but there were others who were martyred for the faith. There were some who were sawn in two, that they were imprisoned, that they were beaten, that they were starved. And yet he says, but these people prospered by what? They prospered by faith, by hope and the promises of God, that even of these people that endured all the afflictions of this world, that because they held the faith and the promise of God's word, they were people of whom the world was not worthy. And the preacher of Hebrews takes these two extremes of the great conquering power of faith and the great power of faith to endure afflictions. He says, faith. Faith is the answer for the Christian. In all things and in all circumstances. And as we face death, we must face it through the fight of faith. You remember that death is inherently fearful. And if you don't fear death or see that death is fearful, you have not understood death. But the good news of the gospel is that we have faith to wield against the fear of death. And in holding to faith and being people of faith, we see that death can be overcome and that the fear of death can be mitigated. For the Christian, 
death is robbed of its sting and its victory. Because in death, the covenant of God is still in force. Even when we face death, God's covenant of grace isn't removed from us. This is something that will extend into eternity. That in death, our union with Christ still holds. The death for the believer is noted in the New Testament in several places as a falling asleep. Right? That Christ's death has taken away the sting and the fear that is inherent to death. That death is a doorway to everlasting glory, that death is simply our departing from this world to be translated in the age that comes to stand before Christ and to behold him in his glory. We are to fight the fear of death by faith. Hear these glorious words that the Apostle Paul wrote in one of the greatest chapters of the New Testament, Romans 8. He says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul speaks of all the afflictions and the tribulations. He speaks even of death itself. And he says death can't rob the believer from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We are to fight the fear of death by faith. And the fourth virtue that Bolton speaks of is that we are to survey our faith. That we are to take stock of our faith, inventory, if you will, of our faith. And he uses the example of the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. He says that there are many who, like the foolish virgins, don't take stock of of their faith. They don't survey their faith. And that we ought to be as those wise virgins who did take stock of their faith. That they ensured that they had their wicks trimmed, that they had enough oil and burning in their cup. And in a wonderful way in this section, what Bolton does is he confronts the wise and the foolish virgins with four questions that are meant to help us survey our own faith. Are we foolish? Or are we wise? Are we taking stock of our faith or do we have no care for our faith? And Bolton says, how do you discern? Are you a wise or a foolish virgin? Well, ask yourself, how did you come by your faith? You know, if you ask a foolish virgin how they came by their faith, right? the foolish one can't give an account of the surpassing worth of Jesus Christ. They can't remember the pain of temptation and of guilt that they were awakened to and of their desperate need for Jesus Christ. That a foolish person doesn't think about how they came to faith because there wasn't any opportunity, there wasn't any newness, there wasn't any enlightenment or illumination that they were sinful and guilt-ridden in need of a Savior and of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, but of the wise, the wise can remember the work of salvation in their hearts. They can remember what it was to die to themselves. They can remember the weight of sin, the freeness of grace, and the glory of Jesus that redeemed them and saved them. Now, in no way is both insane that we ought to know the very day and the hour and the minute on which we were saved. I know I certainly don't. But I know that looking back on my life and asking, where did my 
faith come from? How did I come into faith? Did I know that there was a time when I was lost in my sins and my guilt and my transgressions and there was a time when God in his mercy awakened me to the newness of life? And that's the experience of those who have faith. There is a discernible difference in how they used to live and how they now live, how they used to view the gospel, how they now view the gospel. Bulletin puts a second question. He says, well, ask yourself, how do you keep faith? And he says of the foolish people, when you ask them, how do you keep faith? They're not troubled by this question. They have no scruples. They have no doubts. They have no distrusts or terrors or temptations or wantings or weaknesses that the Foolish people aren't clamoring to sit under the means of grace and the preaching of God's word and of reading Christian literature and of learning and growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when it comes to keeping faith, that the foolish think, what, what are you talking about? Why do I need to keep faith? Why does this need to be diligent? And Bolton says that that's, that's foolishness. But of the wise, actually he says of the foolish, he has this wonderful quote that they can believe, that they think they can just believe quietly, follow their business, and go to heaven without so much ado. And he says, but of the wise, that the wise make a careful and a diligent guarding of their faith, to flourish their faith by making use of the means that God has given, and chiefly the means of grace, to strengthen their faith, and that daily they resolve to fly to Christ over and over again for the grace and the strength that he provides. And the fourth question that he puts to them is he says, well, what has changed in your life? What has changed from when you weren't a Christian to when you were a Christian, when you weren't embracing Christ by faith to when you embraced him by faith? And he says of fools, they have no lasting to come. That their lives don't look any different, that their thoughts aren't any different, that their desires aren't any different. He says, but of the wise, when we take stock of our faith, they, we should see ourselves as a new creature. We should see that the sins that we used to love and enjoy, that now we repent of them and we hate them. That we should know something of the experience of sanctification in all of our faculties and in all of our parts. We should have an earnest desire for universal obedience to God's commands and a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. And the fourth question he asks is, ask how do you prize the object of your faith? He says the foolish ones have very little, they have very little pleasure in the Lord and in the things of the Lord. And in looking at that parable of the pearl of great price, Bolton says of them that the foolish ones think that they will have the pearl at their own price. But the wise delight in God, and they delight in the things of God and of Christ, and of the pearl of great price. They give everything for it. They give even life itself to lay hold of the treasure of the kingdom of God. And so Bolton says we ought to take stock of our faith. We ought to, from time to time, hold ourselves up to the wise and the foolish virgins and to ask, which one am I? Am I one who has my lantern wick trimmed and my oil ready? Or am I as the foolish who goes on sleeping, despite the reality that Christ is coming, that death is approaching? We ought to survey our faith. I want to close just with a question. Bolton has taught us and shown us the means that we are to use in preparing for death and the virtues that we ought to cultivate in preparing for death. But what if you are one who feels like you are so unprepared to face death? You might be a child and you might think, really never given death a second thought, let alone how to prepare for death. You might be a middle-aged person with all sorts of priorities and responsibilities and obligations, and you might be thinking, who has time for these weighty and these heavy things? I need to earn money. I need to 
work diligently at my job. I need to get my kids here and I need to get them there. I have housework that I need to keep up on. You might be an older folk. You might be thinking, wow, I don't feel like my whole course of life has been a conscionable preparative to die comfortably. I've squandered so many years of my life and so many thoughts and so many opportunities. And well, what do we do if we feel unprepared to die? The great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that today is yet the day of salvation. That so long as we have breath in our lungs, that we have the opportunity to seek the means that God has given to prepare ourselves to die, that by his grace we have the Spirit working within us to cultivate these virtues that allow us to face the reality of death. And so it's not too late. And what we do is we repent of our failure to prepare for death, and then we walk in the joy and the comfort of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that he gives grace. He gives grace to fulfill and to satisfy what he has called us to. There is no need to despair. But so long as it is called today, we can begin right now by preparing for death. Preparing through the means that God has given and preparing by cultivating, by His grace, these virtues. As we come back in our next session, we will turn to consider death, four more things concerning death, no longer preparing for death, but death itself, before we turn our attention to judgment, hell, and heaven. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and evening.